My name's Gord Hodgkiss. I'm the uh, co-chair of, of the Kelowna Canadian Italian Club's Heritage Committee. Um, and over the last two to three years, we've been doing a, a lot of work together with my co-chair, uh, Don Ramponi, um, <clears throat> to really look at the, the Kelowna story here. And, and the major chapter of that story was just written, um, or an additional chapter was just written um, last week uh, with, with Trudeau's formal apology. We actually did a presentation back in 2019 talking about uh, the internment of uh, Italian Canadians. And we did that with a specific focus on BC. Um, and so part of what we're gonna be talking about tonight is a revised version of that presentation um, to kind of give you the historical context, but also I was very excited um, to welcome our panelists and we're gonna be introducing those shortly. Um, to provide additional, additional context around this story, but also to bring us up to date, because like I said, we have a, a new chapter now. Um, so uh, why don't we jump in? Um, I am going to be doing double duty and letting people, admitting people. So, um, but let's start with the, the formal part of the presentation. Mr. Speaker, Signor Presidente, I rise in this House today to issue an official apology on behalf of Italian Canadians, on behalf of the Government of Canada for the internment of Italian Canadians during the Second World War. To the men and women who were taken to prisoner of war camps or jail without charge, people who are no longer with us, to hear this apology. To the tens of thousands of innocent Italian Canadians who were labeled enemy aliens. To the children and grandchildren who have carried a past generation's shame and hurt. And to their community, a community that has given so much to our country. We are sorry. Chiediamo scusa. So that happened on May 27th. Um, tonight, as I mentioned, we have some special guests here. I want to do a very quick introduction of those guests. We'll get into, um, get into a bit, getting to know them a little better when we get to the panel. But first of all, I want to welcome Trina Costantini Powell. Trina is the president of the National Congress of Italian Canadians in Ottawa. Uh, her grandfather actually was also interned in Petawawa. Ray Lenzi, um, I mentioned in uh, the promotion for this that there was actually one member of, or one Italian from the Okanagan who was interned, uh, and his name was uh, Federico Lenzi. Well, Ray is his grandson, and he's going to be giving us um, kind of his perspective on what it's meant for him. Uh, Adriana Davies. Adriana is a historian, a heritage consultant, an author, um, and she's also Italian. Uh, she comes from the, the Calabrese, or she's Calabrese, comes from Calabria. Um, and uh, she's going to be, she was also, she was also involved with the National Congress of Italian Canadians and uh, was involved quite a lot, you know, over quite a bit of this journey to get us to the apology. Uh, Lynn Bowen is the author of Whoever Gives Us Bread, the Story of Italians in BC. Uh, I first met Lynn in 2019 when, we, when she came and spoke at the club. Um, so very much looking forward to the perspective that she'll be adding. And finally, we have our own Roseanne Nancy, who will be the moderator, and she is the president of the Kelowna Canadian Italian Club. Welcome all. Um, so let's go forward. Uh, just some quick details about the, the interment itself. So, at the time in 1940, when, when this internment happened, there was 112,000 Canadians across Canada. Of those, there was 
597 male internees, and there was actually four female internees as well, uh, all from the Ontario area, I believe. In BC here, we had 55 internees, 44 were from Vancouver, seven from Trail, two from Yubu, one from Greenwood, and as I mentioned, one from Summerland here in the Okanagan. Of those internees, 235 were, were naturalized Canadians. 22 were actually Canadian born. 63% of the internees had family and the average internment was 15 and a half months. Uh, the longest amount of time spent interned was five years. But it wasn't just the internment. At the same time, 31,000 Canadians, Italian Canadians were declared enemy aliens. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about that too. And this was all because of a fear basically um, of having an enemy inside our borders. Was that fear ever re realized? There was actually only that I could find in my research, one act of sabotage in all of Canada during World War II. It actually did happen in trail and it happened with some German nationals uh, who actually tried to blow up some sulfuric acid tanks at the Kaminko shelter in trail. Nothing ever happened with Italian Canadians. No, Ita no Italian Canadians were ever formally charged with a crime. Today, what I'm gonna be talking about is, we're gonna talk a little bit about what happened to Canadian Italians generally um, during World War II in Canada, but especially here on BC, but we're also gonna focus on what happened here in the central Okanagan, because in a lot of ways, it was a different story that happened here. Um, and that was, it was different for a lot of reasons. And we wanna cover some of those reasons um, in this presentation, but, you're gonna see a picture here of a picnic. This picnic was actually a good, a good percentage of the Italians who lived in Kelowna in 1938. And in 1938, in August, um, they decided to have a picnic um, and they all joined, uh, I'm guessing City Park um, to have that picnic. One year later, there was another club that had another picnic. Uh, that was the Chirkolo Giordani Club in Vancouver. Uh, pictures look very similar. Um, you know, we, we have a very similar look, a very similar vibe, but there was a difference. In this picture of this club, 44 men would be interned. In the picture I showed before in Kelowna, not one man would be interned. So what was the difference between those two clubs? Well, let's take a closer look. If we look at the faces, not a lot of difference between them. The Vancouver group seems to be a little more musical based on the instruments they're holding. Uh, they had a watermelon. We see evidence of that. But, but the clue is actually not in the faces. It's in a, an unusual place. So let's take a look at that place. The clue is actually here. It's in the date. So let's blow that up so you can get a better look. You're, you're gonna see after the, the year 1939, there's actually some Roman numerals, uh, the Roman numerals for 17. If we look at the Canadian one or the Kelowna one and we blow up the date, there's no Roman numerals. So what's the significance of the Roman numerals? Well, when the fascists took over in Italy, they actually changed the calendar. Um, so they started marking their years after the March on Rome, which happened in 1922. So in 1939, that would be 17 years after the March on, the March on Rome. So if you happen to be adherents to what was happening in Italy and fascism, it was kind of a show of support to include these Roman numerals on your, on your photo. And that is actually clue of the difference between the two clubs. The Chircolo Giordani Club wanted to be seen as supporting fascism. So what happened in 1940? Well, 
suddenly there was this, you know, when, when war, when Mussolini declared war on England, which then of course triggered war on Canada and Canada reciprocally declared war, there was suddenly the, this, this backlash against Italians throughout the country. And the, these are just some of the, these were pulled from the papers at the time. Um, and you can kind of, by reading them, get a, get a sense as to what the, the feelings were here, slimy, subversive, um, you know, the, the smoothest roundup of enemies in, in the history of, of Montreal, jackals, they were called in Toronto. I mean, these were visceral and angry remarks against people that in a lot of cases had lived in Canada for years and years and years and were neighbors. Um, and, you know, it, it really, I think we, we saw different outbreaks of this feeling in different places, but it was certainly much more of an urban phenomenon. Um, and it was different here in Kelowna. And that's, that's one of the things we want to talk about. Now, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about the internment camps. There were actually three internment camps throughout Canada. There was one in Kananaskis. Um, there was one in, in Ontario in Petawawa, and there was actually one in New Brunswick in Gagetown. If, when you're able, you are taking a drive um, to, uh, to Calgary or to Alberta, and you want to check out the Kananaskis campsite, you can actually do that. If once you pass Banff heading towards Canmore, um, this map kind of shows the, the location of that. There are a couple of structures left. This guard tower um, it was actually built. It wasn't, this guard tower actually didn't exist when the Italians were interned there. It was only built after when they got more Jim, German prisoners of war. Um, they felt they needed additional security. These were higher risk. Um, and the camp command, commandment, commander's uh, quarters is still there. It's called the Colonel's Capt Cabin. So what was an enemy alien? Well, according to the government of Canada at the time, all Italian nationals and any Italians nationalized after 1922, which was kind of the, the calendar date they decided was where the risk was, were designated as enemy aliens. Um, across Canada, like I said, about 31,000 Italians were enemy aliens, which would have represented about a quarter of all Italians living in Canada at the time. Of the 4,500 Italians in Vancouver, about 1,800 fell into this category and were registered. Now, we don't have exact numbers for Kelowna, but Given the factors I'm going to be talking about later, it's reasonable to assume that the percentage would have been less than 25%, and that's for multiple reasons. The definition had no exclusions. It applied to men, it applied to women, it applied to children, and basically their rights in Canada were with the stroke of a legislative pen basically evaporated. They were subject to seizure, imprisonment, internment. They were not entitled to the benefit of the laws, civil or criminal. They lost all their rights overnight. Adriana, I'm gonna ask you to perhaps, because I know you've, you've looked at this, comment on this was drastic. Um, was this unusual in wartime? Well, one has to go back to the Initial War Measures Act, which was passed, um, I believe, on August 22nd, uh, 1914, and of course applied to the First World War. And the belligerents, of course, the enemy were Germans and Austro-Hungarians. And within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that included parts of Ukraine. And so of the about 8,000 internees then, 5,000 of them were, um, of U were Ukrainian. Um, and well, when we get to the issue of redress, um, it's, Im it's important because the historic redress were to do with um, Ukrainians in the First World War 
than the Japanese and, and Italians in, in the Second World War. Um, another observation I would make was that initially the date of, of naturalization was September 1st, 1929. Now, I think it's, some, it's important to note that then it was shifted to September 1st, 1922. And of course, that is when Mussolini came to power. So, uh, you know, I, I, th I throw those, those out. So that it wasn't a, it, it, that implies that there's only one War Measures Act, <clears throat> but of, of course the, the first War Measures Act was uh, it related to World War One, and then we also have to rem remember that Pierre Elliott Trudeau imposed the War Measures Act with respect to uh, Quebec separatists when you had the kidnappings and the bombings and so on. So just a little bit of context. Perfect. Thank you, Adriana. So to understand what happened in June 1940 and, and understand what led us there, we're going to go back almost two decades. And that's because sometimes you have to look at history in the context of the times. You can't always look at it with hindsight, and make judgments about what was right or what was wrong. Um, and when we think of fascism now, we think of something evil or horrendous, um, but that wasn't always the case. And it's important to understand that. So let's, let's take a little, uh, a little progression through time here to see how we got to where we were on June 10th, 1940. First of all, November 9th, 1921, that's when the fascist party is founded. Uh, and Mussolini was actually elected to the Italian parliament. On September 1st, 1922, as Adriana um, just mentioned, that, was the, that becomes the date for determining who is the enemy alien. And that's because 1922 is when the fascists came to power. And it was on October 28th that the, the March on Rome happened. And what's, what's kind of interesting about that is this picture, which shows Mussolini marching with the black shirts was actually a staged opportunity. He didn't march to Rome. He actually took the train, but he had publicity pictures taken with the marchers. He stayed in Milan. 1925, this becomes important when we look at what happened in Canada because the, the two were tied. In 1925, the fascists started Dopa Lavoro um, and it was, it was an after hours, literally means after work, after hours, um, social and cultural club that was organized by the fascist movement as a way to kind of provide a social out outlet. Um, it's also important to realize that this was a way to combat socialism. And we have to remember that this was all happening only eight years after the October Revolution. Um, and Lenin came to power in Russia, the world was very fearful about communism. And to understand fascism, you have to understand the, the, the fears of communism at the same time. In 1927, the Turco Giordani Club was formed in Vancouver. Um, Lynn, I'm gonna ask you to comment on why that was important in Vancouver at the time. There, un unmuted, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, well, it was a very controversial club, um, and, but you're, you were asking me to speculate on the importance of that time. Yeah, like why was it formed? Why did the Italians, the members of this club felt, feel that this club was needed? Um, I can't, I'm not sure I can answer that. The, uh, it was five years after um, Mussolini took power. Um, Adriana, feel free to, to add your comments there. In, Nove in November, December um, and January of, of uh, 1922, uh, Italia Garibaldi 
the granddaughter of, of Giuseppe Garibaldi, uh, the great Italian patriot and unifier, was sent by Mussolini to Canada to see about the setting up of agricultural colonies. Um, there was already one established um, in 1914 um, in the Laclavish area of Alberta. Uh, and it, there, there, there was Venice and, and Hilo. They were Altitaliani, Northern Italians, and Hilo was supposed to be named Trieste, but when the post office was named, the railroad decided that it would name it Hilo. It was a board game. Now, she visited Italia, met with the Minister of Immigration in Ottawa, and then she traveled through the Prairie Provinces, but not, she did not come to BC. She visited Edmonton, um, Calgary and Venice and the media gourd lionized her you know that she presented herself as um, you know these war heroes who opposed communism and, and, and so on and uh, immediately after she returned you had the beginning of the formation of, of Fasci the communist cells in Alberta they were established in um, Edmonton, Calgary, Venice, and Lethbridge. And then in November 1926, the provincial fascia was established. And the uh, Felice de Angelis, who was the consular agent, a young civil engineer who had helped to found the um, Venice Hilo colonies, um, was, is pictured in his fascist uniform, but the other consular agents were um, Pietro Colbertaldo, who is important in terms of BC because event, he would serve in um, Winnipeg after leaving Edmonton. This would have been around 1933, 34. And he went to Italy to study, to become a fascist consul. And that's then when you have the era of fascist consuls across the country. Now, what is interesting is the 1927 date of the Circolo Giordano Bruno is that it fits in with, you know, setting up of these provincial uh, fasci in the largest population centers. So I think that, um, and it was clear from the get go. It, when the uh, fascio, the provincial fascia was set up in Calgary, representing 200 people, this is mentioned in the Calgary Herald, the day after the formation, um, there was Alex Pico, who was um, a member of the local um, uh, Italian club, uh, one of the um, Ordine Indipendente, uh, Figli d'Italia, opposed fascism. So you had this split. And so to get to your point, Gord, it, that of course the Giulio, uh, Giulio Giordani Club uh, was from the get-go um, a fascist um, society. And of course it would have been opposed by others. And there was this divide in the Italian community. Perfect. Thank you, thank you for that context. And actually it was named after a fascist martyr uh, who was assassinated in Italy. So just in their name, it, it made it very clear that, that it was um, a fascist organization. Gord? Yeah. I, I believe that uh, in 1927 also the, the General Bureau of Italians Abroad was established, which was the start of the vice consuls being sent over. And we're going to be, yeah, thank you. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the influence of those vice consuls because it's a big part of this story as well. Um, now, interestingly, <clears throat> when you joined this club in the membership form, the wording 
Um, I swear to execute without discussion the orders of Bill Duce and to serve with all my strength and if necessary, my blood in the cause of the fascist revolution. They were making no bones about this. Yes, we are supporters of Mussolini. We are supporters of the fascist resolution. Um, but again, you have to understand in the context of the time, we're in 1927 here and Mussolini was regarded as the savior of Italy by nobody. Winston Churchill said this. He said, if I had been an Italian, I am sure I would have been with you wholeheartedly with you from the start to the finish in your triumphant struggle. There was a lot of support for Mussolini in the world. And, and it's important by identifying yourself as a fascist in 1927, you were not identifying yourself as anything contrary to, to the, the, the guidelines or the principles of, of what it meant to be a Canadian. In fact, um, you know, there was a lot of political goodwill towards Mussolini at the time. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, as Adriana mentioned, we are starting to get some of this anti-fascist feeling. Certainly in 1929, the Order of Italian Canadians was created in Montreal. And that was to counteract this increasing fascist interference that, as Lynn said, is coming in a lot of cases from the vice consuls who were representatives of the fascist government. So, um, you know, again, there, there's this, this kind of complex picture that's starting to emerge that Italians are caught within. Another huge plus happened in 1929 when the fascists signed the Lateran Accords, uh, basically coming to terms and, and creating peace with the, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so, you know, up to that time, you know, the, the, there was a divide between the two. This brought the two together, and that was very popular um, with many Italians. So in 1932, Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. This picture is a great example of understanding sentiments within the context of the time. We see this picture now, and we have this whole hindsight image of, of course, what happened in World War II and that, and we're probably, this is probably um, troubling to us. But you have to also understand the sentiments towards Hitler in 1932. Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister of Canada, had what can only be described as a man crush on Hitler. Um, he actually commented, it, commented that he had perfect complexion. Um, which is a very odd thing to say, but if you've done any reading about William Lyme Mackenzie King, you know he was a very odd man. So <clears throat> we'll just leave that as a historical footnote at this point. 1934, another bonus, Italy wins the World Cup. Mussolini uses that as a platform to promote fascism. So 1935, things start to change a little bit. Italy and Mussolini make their intentions felt when they, they invade Abyssinia, and now known, or now Ethiopia, the, the League of Nations imposed sanctions. And this was the beginning of the government of Canada starting to look at fasc fascism as potentially a threat. Uh, and it also marks a turning point in how Canada regarded Mussolini. Um, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about the vice consuls um, and their influence. Um, Adriana, just briefly, can, you, you said, you know, Garibaldi came, she was feted through uh, across Canada. Um, you know, Lynn mentioned the, the setup of the vice consuls, you know, how many vice consuls would there have been in Canada and, and kind of where were they located? Um, well, prior to the, what they became was the Regente Consolare, uh, consular regents or royal consuls. Um, consular agents were voluntary positions, like when Felice De Angelis came in 1914, but that 
by 1934, um, Mussolini wanted them to really become part of the Italian consular service. So that in other words, they were professionals. And so the training, you know, going to Italy for training for those who had already, um, you know, espoused um, uh, fascism. But just to go back, the consuls, post 1918, initially they appointed war heroes. And some of those war heroes, of course, became um, uh, fascists, but others were not. So that when, the, when uh, Mussolini made the pact with Germany, then he bought into that whole agenda of conquest that Germany, uh, Hitler said, needed territory, you know, the concept of the Aryan race. And of course, Mussolini followed in his footsteps when he declared war on Abyssinia, Ethiopia, and then of course the, the, the year after um, on Albania. So, you know, he was espousing these Hitlerian um, principles and that but with respect to the RCMP, um, from studies, research that's been done by academic historians in, uh, in Ontario and Quebec, basically the RCMP were, began their surveillance really from about 1925, 26 onwards. And they had the membership lists of the various Italian societies um, across the country. Um, and uh, I found that the, one reference to an LT from Banff, um, who, who is said to have been the manager of the Cascade Hotel and who received mem uh, memberships from Italy and distributed them. Because of my knowledge of Italian history in Alberta, I identified him as uh, Louis Trono. His father and uncles were uh, miners who had come at the end of the 19th, early part of the 20th century. And he was a busboy in various hotels. Um, he was at the founding of the Provincial Fascio. He was, he was 18. So, um, to then finally answer your question, there would have been consular agents in all of the principal cities across the country, or, or consuls. At that point, they were consuls, uh, regente consulare. Um, probably, I would say, uh, two dozen. Okay, thank you. And we start to see um, kind of going as we, we kind of move through 35, 36, more of overt um, opposition to, to the fascists. We started to see anti-Italian letters starting to appear in the letters to the editor in Vancouver, in Toronto, in Montreal. We started to see anti-Italian protests. Um, and <laughs> one kind of interesting story with an Okanagan angle, um, at the vice consul's office in Vancouver, a strange package come. At that time, there had been threats received by the office. Uh, this box came, nobody knew where it came from. Uh, so they treated it suspiciously. Um, and very carefully examined the contents. It turned out to be a case of wine from Kelowna Wines from the Okanagan sent to the vice consul to welcome him. In 1936, we had Leco, the uh, Italian Canadese paper in Vancouver. And this paper regularly, it actually had a, a feature um, on El Duce. So they, they constantly, you know, said, here's what's happening with Mussolini, here's what's happening with fascism. This again was one of those kind of red flags that eventually the RCMP used to determine who would be interned and who wouldn't. Um, the, the editor of this paper actually was interned. Um, when we're talking about, 
we're going to talk a little bit later about, you know, the people were interned. Were they, were they actually fascist? Were they, they publicly saying they were fascist? Or were they caught in un unfortunate circumstances where they kind of um, guilty by association? And one of the things that kind of muddied the water was Italy began offering free trips um, to Canadian Italians, especially the youth, so they could see the glories of the fascist empire. That was a pretty attractive offering, right? So in a lot of cases, you had association with groups like, like the Turkola Giordani Club um, and uh, interactions with, with the consul um, to get a trip to Italy. Um, at that time, uh, Brancucci becomes the new Italian vice consul in Vancouver. They started offering language lessons. They started offering cultural events, always sponsored by the Italian consul. They also brought um, culture, Italian culture, in this case, sopra a soprano um, to Vancouver. Uh, Brancucci actually is in the upper right of the picture. Um, you know, so, so you had this kind of sh sh showing off, I guess, of the glories of fascism um, in the new world. In 1938, uh, the fascists put the Manifesto della Razza in place, uh, which stripped Jews of all rights. And again, following in the footsteps of what was happening in Nazi Germany. Um, and again, in hindsight, we look at this and we, we know where it led to. Um, but, you know, when you compare that to the stripping of Italians of rights, one could argue, is it any different than what Canada ended up doing to Italians? I mean, certainly the outcome um, down the road might be different, but at the time, you know, this, this was simply following what the Germans were doing. So in 1939, um, things start to heat up. That's when Italy and Germany signed a pact of steel, uh, pledging to support each other in the event of war. Um, there was a strong pro-British rally by members of the anti-fascist Italian community in Vancouver to greet King George the sixth and Queen Elizabeth. Here's a picture of that. Um, again, in 1939 is when we had that picnic uh, picture that we showed. Um, and it was in August 25th, as Adriana mentioned, uh, that Canada invoked the War Measures Act for the second time. Uh, September 1st, of course, Germany invades Poland. On September 3rd, two days later, uh, the Parliament of Canada passes the Defense of Canada Regulations, basically giving police the, the power to detain without charge anyone who might act in a way prejudicial to public safety. September 10th, one week later, Canada declares war on Nazi Germany. Shortly after that, uh, there was a public event, a dinner in Vancouver, and Fred Taneshi, uh, a pro-fascist from Trail, delivers what could only be described a very fervent speech in support of Mussolini. Um, RCMP, as, as Adriana mentioned, there, there's indications that they were kind of collecting this list for a long time, but certainly in 1939, they stepped up their efforts to do so. But again, there was something happening at that time that, that's interesting to note. Up until the, the focus switched to fascism, the RCMP were primarily policing communists in Canada. Um, and a lot of their undercover agents were already assigned to infiltrate communist organizations. So they didn't have a ton of undercover agents to start covering all these fascist organizations. So in a lot of cases, they relied on informants. Um, and that would prove to be problematic down the road. That's a pr uh, picture of Fred Taneshi. And on May 29, 1940, the RCMP sent a list of suspected fascists recommended for internment to Justice Minister Ernest Lapointe. Um, it was a long list. There were many, many names on it, certainly more than were actually interned, but that was the list that was sent. That brings us to June 10th. 
at 9 a.m. Pacific time, Mussolini declares war on Britain and France and the RCMP are sent out. Based on that list, they had to round up what they felt were the biggest problems, the ones that they felt were most dangerous. This picture here is actually the roundup in Montreal. Um, the RCMP had sworn in a number of special deputies to help with this roundup. Uh, when the people were taken, the families weren't told where they were taken. In some cases, it would be days. In some cases, it would be weeks before the family heard what happened to them. So that's the big picture. Let's focus in a little bit more um, on the story of Santo Pasqualini. Um, Santo was a baker in Vancouver. And his, one of his biggest clients was the uh, Circolo Giordani Club. And Santo was approached saying, you know, it would be a good idea if you wanted to keep our business for you to become a member. Alice, uh, Santo's wife, had not been to see her parents in Italy for a long time. And the carrot was dangled. Well, if you became a member, there is a chance that you may get a free trip to Italy Alice could go back and see her parents. Um, so long story short, Santo joined the club. Now this is somewhat ironic because he left Italy in 1922 because things were getting too political, but it came full circle. On June 10th, um, he, had, he was a baker, so he had been working the night shift and he was actually asleep when the RCMP came to his door at 2 p.m. Alice was working at the bakery. She had no idea what happened until she got home. Well, actually, Santo would come and pick her up and they'd walk home together. Santo never showed up. Alice went home to find out what happened and found out that Santo was gone. Alice had no idea where Santo was. Not until this postcard came two days later. And through a friend, she found that Santa was actually being held at the Canadian Customs Building in Vancouver. So she walked the four kilometers to the building with Lena, Lena, her daughter, and little Lino, her son, who rode his tricycle alongside. They couldn't talk to him, they couldn't see him, but they did see him in a second floor window and all they could do is wave to him. Lena started crying and ran to see her dad. She was stopped at the door by, the, by a guard. She would not see her father again for 25 months. This is Lino and Lena. This was actually a card that they sent to Santo on his first Christmas in internment. So what happened to Santo? Well, he was boarded on a train and at least for part of that train ride, he would have been chained to his seat. And the train went to Kananaskis, it actually went to a station at CB. At CB, they were walked off the train, chain gang fashion, and loaded on trucks where they were drive, driven to the camp at Kananaskis. That was about an 11 kilometer drive. When they got to the camp, they were a little taken aback by, because they were greeted by German prisoners who were already there. And the German prisoners greeted their Italian allies with a chorus of cheers and Nazi salutes. The Italians didn't know quite what to make of this. Uh, each attorney, their clothes were taken and he was given a uniform. Then they were assigned a bunk. Most of the huts were primarily German. Um, and Ray, this would have been true for your grandfather too when he got there. Um, and the Italians were kind of slotted in. Santo actually ended up in a, in a hut that was primarily Italian. This was actually a picture that was, driven, that was uh, done of Santo when he was in Petawawa um, by another internee. And I believe, Trina, you may have a picture of your grandfather that might have been drawn by the same internee, I believe. He would remain there for another 25 months. Other men were let go, but despite repeated efforts from the Italian community in Vancouver, 
Santo is not granted release. But as bad as it was for Santo, it was actually worse for Alice. I'm gonna tell her story in a minute, but first let's learn a little bit more about what life was like in the camp. I mentioned they were given uniforms. Well, this was the uniform. It had a red target on the back, a red circle, supposedly to provide a target to guards if you were trying to escape. What was interesting, I mentioned there was Germans there. Um, very interesting dy dynamic emerged in the Kananaskis camp. At first, the Germans and the Italians got along okay. That lasted until they had a soccer match and the Italians won. Suddenly, the Germans didn't like that. Uh, and from there, things started to fall apart. And relationships between the German prisoners and the Italian prisoners um, degraded to the point where um, at one point, all the Italians were moved. They wanted to consolidate them all in Petawawa. So they were all sent off to Petawawa. Um, the idea was, well, if we have all the Italians in one place, they should get along better together. That actually didn't prove to be the case. By the time the Western Italians got to Petawawa, the Eastern Italians had already established a social camp hierarchy and the Western Italians always felt that they were considered inferior to the ones who had already been in Petawawa. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this and then I'm, I'm going to ask Trina if they have any stories because that's where her grandfather was interned was in, in Petawawa. I'm gonna be talking specifically about um, Frederick, Frederico Lenzi a little bit later and, and Ray, you'll have a chance to comment there. But when you talk to the people that were interned, there were certainly different stories and different levels of hardship. But, you know, in a lot of cases they had, as you can see from this picture, they, they had activities. There was a band there. Um, they had recreational opportunities. They, they did work uh, and I believe were paid 20 cents a day while they were working. Um, the biggest thing was um, it was a city without women and it was a city without families. It was the separation from their loved one was, that was probably the thing that impacted them the most. And also worrying about how things were going with their family and their businesses while they were in turn. That was probably the hardest thing. Um, Trina, did, did you have any stories that were passed down from your grandfather about what life was like in the camp? So my stories come from my father who was the baby of the family and um, all my father's siblings, there were seven children in all, were born here in Canada and my, my grandfather wanted to make them as Canadian as possible. So when he was interned and when he was picked up on June 10th, 1940, about three o'clock in the afternoon, um, my father couldn't vividly remember, and he was only seven at that time, the RCMP coming to the door, coming into the house, um, rummaging through the house and taking newspapers, radios. Um, my aunt, who was three years older than my dad, had the foresight to grab the bust of Mussolini. There was there was a bust of Mussolini and um, it, it was there and she ran out the back door with RCMP agents, you know, chasing after her and tackling her and taking that away. Um, he was taken away. Uh, they didn't know where he, um, where he had been taken to. And it was only a few days later when the family received word that he was on his way to Petawawa. Now, this was a family that had lost their mother the year before, very suddenly. My grandmother was only 39 when she died. So here was a, here was a household with no mother and now no father. So the oldest sister would have been uh, 1920 at that time. Uh, she stepped in to play both roles. <clears throat> and she became not so much the breadwinner because some of the other younger children started to deliver newspapers or fruit from 
you know, the local peddlers and that just to make some money. Because of course, there was no social safety net, anything like that. Um, so my, my aunt, as I say, who was only 20, um, became the advocate for the family. And she would um, often go up to Parliament Hill to uh, lobby uh, the local member of Parliament, who his name was George McElroy, who had been a good friend of my grandfather's. He would often be at their home. Um, my grandfather apparently was one who, um, he was a, a very well-known community leader, and there were many politicians and clergy and many other uh, important people that would be around their table. So my aunt would go with Mrs. Tietzi. Uh, she was the wife of Gino Tietzi, one of the five men from Ottawa interned, and they would go up to Parliament Hill to lobby um, the, uh, the members of Parliament. And they could never, of course, get an answer. And um, of course, we know there were no charges um, ever laid. And my grandfather was released um, about nine months after the fact. But um, he was, um, when he was in the camp, he was apparently tasked with delivery mail <clears throat> to some of the prisoners. And by chance, one day, he happened to see a new paper lying on the desk of a guard and he went to take a look at it and he was caught and he was thrown in solitary confinement for about a week um, just you know for taking a look at, at what was going on I gather in the world uh, I think that experience left him a very broken man he um, he had um, he had worked at the Ottawa train station as a baggage handler but he had also been the part owner of a very um, a famous uh, tavern on Preston Street, which is the heart of our little Italy, uh, called the Preston Hotel. And um, when he when he was in the camp, it was uh, signed over in a gentleman's agreement to his lawyer. And when he came out, um, he never got it back. So just the shame, I think, that that, that existed there. And, you know, that, that's something that it was never really talked about in our family. And it was only when I was a teenager when I, I really only found out about it when I found the charcoal sketch by Cassini. And, you know, uh, Gord, when you explained the Roman numerals, I often wondered what they meant. Um, now, I, now I know what they meant. Ours, uh, uh, on, on my grandfather's uh, sketch, um, the Roman numerals 19 are there. So that would have been done. Uh, it was done on January the 1st, uh, 1941. Yeah. yeah. I learned something tonight. <laughs> so, you know, as Trina said, I mean, there, there were two stories here. There was the story of the people that were interned, but there was also the story of the ones uh, left behind. And I talked a little bit about Alice uh, before. So Imagine Santa was taken away. It would be two days before she knew where he was. She didn't know much English. She had no family in Vancouver. She had no experience running a business other than helping her husband. Um, and the, the, the bakery, they, they lost the bakery um, and she went on, on government assistance. Um, so, you know, Alice actually would have um, an emotional breakdown. She would end up in the hospital. Um, she eventually got out of that. Um, the, the, the good news to the story is she was actually interviewed um, for uh, the project. And I believe she was 99 when she was interviewed. Um, so Alice did survive, um, but you know, you, you can imagine how hard it was for those to try to keep things going when the fathers, the husbands, the, the brothers were sent away. And in a lot of cases, um, as Trina said, businesses were lost and were never recovered. So let's talk a little bit about Federico Lenzi. Federico actually shared a hut with, with Santo Pasqualini. They, they were in the same hut. Um, Ray, I could tell this, but you can tell it better. Can you tell us why your grandfather was interned? Well, the story I heard that uh, 
he was working part-time at the box factory in Summerland and <clears throat> the war had started and uh, he made some comment, somebody they got talking and made some comment about uh, the war in North Africa and how uh, Mussolini, I mean, uh, Romo was running a strong campaign there and it, it, it was going to be hard to stop. And uh, it, it seemed to be that what triggered it and he was arrested after that. Yeah, and, and Federico actually would leave behind two sons. He, he was lucky, he had two sons to run their farm in Summerland. They had Pietro and Renzo. Uh, he also had a yes. half-finished half contract with the district of Summerland to dig some ditches for municipal work. Um, so, you know, there, there was someone to kind of keep things going and that wasn't the case for a lot of the other internees. Um, when, when we did the first presentation, uh, Ray told me a, a story which I thought was, was priceless. The guards that guarded the, the internment camp were the veterans guards, so they were older and they weren't always in top physical shape. So there was a work detail that was sent out um, and they were, they were cutting wood. Um, they were loaded in an old army truck, six Italians and one guard. And the guard ended up having a heart attack while they were out on the work detail. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there, Ray, and I'm gonna let you tell the second half of the story. Well, uh, yeah, they're all cutting wood because they had to keep warm. I, like my grandfather said, it was a, a, a horrid old buildings that were it's hard to keep warm in, in the winter and they were sent out to cut wood and uh with this guard when they're out there he had a heart attack it was very cold so the other italian guys and him got their jackets wrapped them up as best they could loaded them in the back of the truck and drove back to the internment camp and uh when they got there got help for the guard and i don't know if he lived or not but uh, they got him back there and people asked them why they didn't run, why they didn't escape because they had a chance. And he said he came to Canada to be a Canadian and he was, what do you use of running? Because they'd be chasing for the rest of his life. Thanks, Ray. I, I love that story. So, Unlike a lot of them that were rounded up June 10th, um, you know, in, in Federico's case, it, it was a little bit after that. Um, I still haven't found the exact date when he was actually interned. I couldn't find it in the records, um, but he had a whole community of, behind him. Basically the entire community of, of Summerland rallied to the support and wrote letters, including his employer, um, Major Hutton, and actually, um, the RCMP inspector who ended up interning him, arresting him and interning him also wrote a letter of support to Justice Heinemann. So they would have these tribunals at the camp where basically Justice Heinemann would, would hear the evidence and would make a decision. Now, it's an interesting to know, Heinemann didn't have the right to let them go. He would provide his recommendations to Ernest Lapointe, the, the Minister of Justice, and it was Ernest Lapointe's decision whether they would go. So I believe there was at least two rounds with Lindsay where there were two letters written, but this was the letter that was in the file. And, you know, he, Frederico was actually released and returned to his farm before everyone was moved to Petawawa. Um, I think he was in turn for about a year um, in Kananaskis. And again, this was in the letter that Hyman wrote, um, just as Ray said, he made a statement in the effect that he hoped Italy would win the war. He denies he made a statement. He was not represented by counsel and didn't understand what his rights were. Another interesting thing, if you were uh, interned, you had to vest your property over to the custodian of enemy property and quite a bit of the file deals with this. Um, looking, you know, kind of inspecting the orchard, making sure it was run. In this case, the reports were, it seems to be being run well by the sons that were left. Um, so 
you know, there, there there's, was a number of these in the Lindsay file. Um, the interesting thing was uh, when Frederick Lindsay was actually released, he received a bill. Um, and the bill was to pay off for looking after the property while he was interned. <laughs> to add insult to injury, they actually got a bill from the government to look after their property that was taken away from them while they were interned. Uh, a lot of those bills, it, there was some, connect, some collection notices back and forth in the file. And I think the, the amount was actually halved at one point. Um, I'm not sure if it was ever paid, Ray, I'm not sure if you know, but generally those custodial fees were set at about 2% of the value of your property that was vested over to the government. Um, but as I said, there was also 31,000 um, Italians that were labeled enemy aliens. So what, is, what did that mean? Well, it meant they had to register. It meant they had to report monthly to the RCMP. Um, Basically, they, they had to carry a card. Um, one thing that we've heard anecdotally in Kelowna, and we don't have any firm evidence of this, but it seems to, it seems to be based on family stories that a number of Italians that weren't interred, but interned, but they, they were gently suggested by the RCMP that maybe they should move somewhere else, move away from Vancouver into the interior. So we have one family in the interior. They thought that their uncle in this case was interned. We said, no, he actually wasn't. But what we, where, where we end up is we believe he was told by the RCMP it would be a good idea to get out of Vancouver and maybe move to the Okanagan where he already had some relatives. So, you know, as Canada got up in arms against this potential fifth column, and the fifth column is a term that is used for kind of the enemies within, right? This is why the Japanese were relocated from the lower mainland um, to interior camps. These are why these particular Italians were interned. They felt they were a threat for sabotage. They would kind of wage war from inside. Um, and as I said, it was the Veterans Guard that was in a lot of cases charged with protecting Canada against this fifth column. Um, they were too old for active duty overseas. In a lot of cases, they were given the jobs of, of guarding the internment camps and other home guard duties. In BC, there was another unit called the Pacific Coast Militia Rangers that also were charged with protecting, in this case, in a lot of cases, they protected rail lines against sabotage. Um, there was a fairly large unit uh, stationed in Hope, which is, of course, the intersection of three different railways at the time. And certainly, Kelowna was not immune. Um, we are going to be talking a little bit about the Italian story, but, um, and the Italians were not treated generally that poorly. The same, unfortunately, was not true for the Japanese. This sign was hanging in Kelowna during World War II. There was a lot of editorial. Um, this is one called, look what, around you, Britain has seven, 70,000 aliens. How many have we in Canada? But the fact is, in the course of the year, no act of sabotage was ever co committed by Italian Canadians, no fifth column was ever seen or heard of. In fact, a lot of, a lot of the enemy aliens enlisted in active service. Um, and in a lot of cases, those that were interned had family members who served for Canada in the war. Um, this picture is actually in Vernon, and this is Luigi Moro. Um, he was registered as an enemy alien at the time of enlistment. He had to report to the RCMP. Um, that's Luigi there. He had to report to the RCMP monthly. He actually um, enlisted, and he talked to his, his officer and said, I'm registered as an enemy alien. Do I Now that I'm serving in the armed forces, do I have to keep reporting to the RCMP and the, his officer said, yes, yes, you're still an enemy alien. 
you have to report. And this is what Luigi said to him. Um, for those of you who don't read Italian, this is basically, well, then you can kiss my ass. Um, so I don't think the officer understood Italian. <laughs> so why didn't it happen here? Well, I think there was a number of reasons. We had a very embedded Italian community. We had a community that relied on agriculture. We had a different representation in the Roman Catholic Church here. We had less influence from vice consuls in the fascist government. And we had different immigration patterns um, as well. We also had a different kind of social organization. In Colonna's case, the club was started in 1938, actually. This would have been right at the, the kickoff. This picture would have been taken right around the time the club started. And a lot of the families had been in the Okanagan for years and years and years, and they simply wanted a social organization. The main impetus for starting the club seems to be to build a clubhouse so they could all get together. So different type of club with different type of motivation. As I said, you know, a lot of the early Italian immigrants that came, came in the late 1800s or the early 1900s. There was very little uh, immigration into the Kelowna area from the second world or the first world war on. Um, and those that came were family members with, with families that were already farming here. And they were simply brought over to help with the farming. And that was aligned with the immigration um, patterns in Canada at the time. It was basically restricted to kind of agricultural inflow with some exceptions. Um, and, you know, it was a very embedded, this is Cap Capozzi. He ran the grocery store um, on Main Street. This was the, the Cap's cash or Capozzi's cash grocery. Um, you know, these are the Len Francos that were farming in the mission area. These are the Casorso family, um, and the Casorso family were hugely successful um, in Kelowna. Um, they actually started the sanitary market on Bernard Avenue, the tallest building on Bernard Avenue. So you had a very well-established, very integrated Italian community. <clears throat> you also had a community that relied on agriculture. And the interesting thing about agriculture is there's no kind of social hierarchy with agriculture. If you work in a mine, there's a very definite social hierarchy where the bosses are generally Canadian or English or American. And then there's this kind of hierarchy of ethnic groups underneath that. And generally the Italians were doing the hard labor, um, whether it's mining or working in a smelter or a sawmill. So you had a very different structure that allowed Italian, generally if you were farming in the mission, everybody helped everybody. And if your neighbors were English or French or Italian, you all helped each other during harvest season, you shared things. And so it was a very different culture. One of my favorite pictures um, is actually this one of the Laurel Packing House that would have been taken. And, you know, notice, you know, a lot of the workers were um, Chinese at the time, um, but they're all there together. And it's kind of that, that was just, the vibe in agriculture during, during that time in the Okanagan. Uh, we talked about the role of the vice consuls. Well, we were arm's length from the vice consuls. There were certainly ties, but they weren't an active day-to-day -day influence in what was happening in the Italian community here in Kelowna. Um, so there wasn't that constant pushing of fascism here in Kelowna like there would have been in Vancouver. The Catholic Church was a big thing. Um, in Vancouver, there was a Roman Catholic minister who was Italian, who was very strongly pushing fascism. Um, <clears throat> this is Monsignor McKenzie. He's Irish Catholic. He's not, he, he's not pushing fascism. He's not pushing Mussolini. And this is the congregation that all the Italians would have gone to. I talked about immigration patterns. So between World War, kind of when we got past the railway construction, which in the Okanagan ended in 1915, just as World War I was starting, um, from that point to after World War II in 1947, when immigration opened up, it was a very different immigration pattern here in the Okanagan. 
a lot of the Italians that were immigrating kind of in that period were either going to major urban centers because that's where they could find work or they were going to industrial communities like Trail and Sudbury and Cape Breton where there were, wine, where there were mines or industrial places where they could find work. That just wasn't the case here in Kelowna. There, we had no mines, we had no smelters, we had some sawmills and that was about it. So most of the Italians that moved here were integrated into their families um, who, are, who were already you know, farming. Um, what was interesting was our club. Our club actually, um, the records we have of the club ended at the end of 1939. We have no records past that. We know they stopped meeting sometime after that. Um, and from doing research on what happened in other places, we think we know what's happened. Um, we believe that on June 10th or shortly afterwards, the RCMP came and visited and suggested very strongly that the club should stop meeting. They also made some other suggestions. We'll be talking about that later. But again, this was a club of primarily, there was two groups in this club. There were the, the agricultural families from the mission. And in the north end of Kelowna, there was a smattering of families that had moved kind of in the 1910 to 1915, just before World War I. Um, sometimes they came to work on railways, but they were fully integrated. The, the president of the club at the time was Samuele Turi. Uh, he had been working at the city of Kelowna for 20 years by the time the war broke out. So these were people that were very involved in the community and they had something to lose. Um, and they were also respected. So different type of club than we saw in Vancouver. Um, I'm just kind of looking at time here and I, I see we're quarter past the hour. Um, I'm gonna really quickly run through the last of our slides and then I wanna get into the panel presentation. Basically, life during the war for Italians here, the, the common consensus was it wasn't too bad. Um, it was a little weird. We'd send packages to Italy um, to help family we had there who had it much worse than we did. And we might get some, some kind of feedback from the postmaster asking why we're sending packages to Italy. Uh, Elmo Rantucci told me a story of he was, a, he was going to school during this and a class had a thing of buying war saving stamps. Um, <clears throat> and the way it worked is if you collected enough stamps, you could sink an Italian ship. Um, and he goes, I just realized there, I'm, I'm doing, I'm collecting money to buy these war stamps to sink a ship that my cousins may be serving on. He said, I didn't realize before that, but it just seemed really strange to me. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to leave the story of the silver trays. Um, it's, it's a fascinating story. Maybe we'll deal with that a bit later, but um, I just wanna make sure we have time for our guests. We're gonna talk a, a lot about the outcome of this in the panel. So I'm gonna skip past that part, but generally, um, the words nobody talked about it seems to be the consensus. And I know both Trita, I, I think all of the panelists will talk a little bit more about that. So um, if you do wanna learn more, there's some excellent books. Uh, Raymond Kulas's Injustice Serve focuses on the BC story. There is a video called Piazza Petawawa. I believe it's available on Vimeo. Um, there's a collection of essays called Beyond Barbed Wire. Uh, and there's a wonderful website um, that I believe, Adriana, you had some involvement in. Uh, it's www.italiancanadianworldwar2.ca. Uh, a lot of the research I did was done on that site. It's a fabulous site. Um, I think the big thing, the big takeaway from this is history is there so we can learn from it. Um, and this is a story about Italians and a lot of you that are listening are of Italian descent. And it's easy to recognize injustice when it's happening to us. But injustice happens to everyone. Um, and just because it's not happening to us because it's happening to them doesn't make it any less just. So let's keep in mind what happened here 
and let's use that lens to look forward to others um, to make sure that all are treated equally and fairly in Canada where we live.